So to really understand how airline fleets operate and how we are where we are today, we have to kind of look back at the history of airlines. The earliest commercial service was carrying U.S. mail and gradually evolved into passenger service, although it went through quite a slew of botched regulations. By the 1930s, airlines were working directly with aircraft manufacturers to build mission-specific aircraft. Airlines needed aircraft that could fly intercontinental flights, or in the case of Pan Am, aircraft that could land where there were no runways, which helped them expand their service into the Caribbean and South America. By the 1950s, airlines entered the jet age, flying higher, farther, and faster than they ever have before. Civil Aeronautics Board regulations helped protect airlines from the exorbitant costs of jet aircraft operations. When the 747 was introduced in the 1960s, this presented a new dynamic for airlines and cargo operators in a wide-body, long-haul aircraft that increased their competition with international carriers. Post deregulation in the late 70s into the early 80s, airline fleets became rapidly expanded. Different operators had different missions, and aircraft manufacturers took advantage of the opportunity to expand their product lines. Into the late 80s and early 90s, technology began to take over aircraft manufacturing, eliminating the number of crew members needed to operate a flight, and also transforming the way that aircraft were designed and built. In the years post deregulation, airlines found themselves scrambling for new and inventive ways to increase revenue and increase passengers, and that's where regional airlines really became a big thing for them. Regional airlines were designed on the concept of bringing smaller markets into the national airline system. Much like the major carriers, regional airlines went through a major push in the mid to late 90s to move towards jet aircraft and away from turboprop aircraft. This was partially based on passenger demand and preference, but also on being able to replace inefficient aircraft that were flying at low load factors with regional jets. All of these combinations result in what we see in airline fleets all over the world today. So modern day airlines can be broken down into just a handful of categories. You have your legacy carriers, who are basically your mainline carriers, your regional airlines, cargo carriers, low cost carriers, and international carriers. Today's legacy carrier network is made up of three major legacy airlines, along with Hawaiian and Alaska, who technically operate as major carriers. And these airlines, as you can see, are a conglomerate of massive amounts of mergers throughout the years. And this has developed the fleets that these airlines operate. So what are the primary functions of fleet planning? Number one is determining aircraft specific to the mission that they're going to be flying for. So let's analyze something really simple like Hawaiian Airlines and their fleet. The Hawaiian Airlines route structure is based on three primary types of routes. Number one, interconnecting the islands of Hawaii with smaller aircraft. Number two, bringing passengers to and from Hawaii from the Asia and the United States. And number three, transcontinental flights to bring them to connecting points from eastern United States and throughout Asia and the South Pacific to those connection points and into Hawaii. The second function of aircraft fleet planning is determining the number of revenue generating seats, or in the case of cargo, number of pounds that can be carried, that an aircraft can hold. Domestic airlines still operate fleets of aircraft from the 70s and 80s. For example, both American and Delta operating fleets of MD-80 aircraft. While these aircraft have higher operating costs, it's much cheaper because they're wholly owned. And each of these aircraft holds about 149 passengers, generating a lot of revenue. Cargo operators aren't very much different. The majority of cargo aircraft are converted former airliners. This significantly reduces the purchase price and cost of operating for these aircraft and their fleets. The third function of fleet planning is meeting the demand of the operation. Whether that be the distance or length of routes, the number of seats needed to accomplish a route, or the passenger preference or internal stakeholder preference. If you sit around airports long enough, or at least as much as I do, you'll see just about every generation of airplanes since the 1970s come through at some point. For domestic carriers, there's been a larger increase in using regional airlines for longer routes that have lower load factors. During my tenure working for Northwest Airlines, we actually had a CRJ-200 route that flew from Minneapolis to Jacksonville, Florida. Smaller aircraft can make the regional routes to hubs or between hubs, while larger aircraft can perform the transcontinental flights, and then the wide-body, 
long range aircraft like the 777, 787, A350, A330 and so on can perform intercontinental flights. So most importantly the aircraft has to be able to accomplish the route especially when we talk about long haul say LA to Sydney Australia you can't do that with a 737. But as far as domestic mid-range flights go airlines have a lot of options in maintaining older fleets that have a lower cost to the airline because they're paid for versus the higher operating cost of more inefficient airplanes or phasing in new aircraft over time that can eventually replace those timing out aircraft while at a higher cost, lower operating cost, and overall return on investment. Considering foreign airline demand, Emirates comes from one of the most wealthy regions of the world in the UAE, operating a fleet of nothing but 777s and A380s. While their airline business model doesn't focus on small route domestic hops, mostly on international travel, their fleet has to consist of long range aircraft with enough space to provide the amenities their customers expect. The fourth function of fleet planning has to determine what the airline flight department and maintenance department structures are going to look like and how they're going to operate. Southwest Airlines is an excellent example of an airline that built their structure on one aircraft model. While the early days of Southwest were formed with just a handful of 727s, they quickly transitioned to the 737 and have operated that aircraft ever since. In the early 2000s, Southwest fleet consisted of the 737 models 200, 300, and 700 that they could type rate all pilots across all aircraft at once. Today's Southwest fleet is slightly more modernized with the oldest aircraft being the 700 model 737, but still this reduces their overall operating cost by having a single airframe for maintenance and pilot training. Other low cost carriers have found benefits to the Southwest model including Spirit, Frontier, and JetBlue, who all predominantly use Airbus A320 and 321 aircraft. The final function of fleet planning, at least that I'm going to cover, is aircraft replacement. As aircraft fleets age and technology changes, airlines have to interject newer aircraft into their fleets. Part of the fleet planning process is determining the best time to replace aging aircraft with modern aircraft. Several factors play into the replacement process, but one of the predominant ones being price. Whether an airline can work out an agreement on a specific airframe or a bulk order or something with a manufacturer to determine long-term sustainable process for upgrading a fleet. So finally, what does the future of fleet planning look like for the airlines? Earlier I pointed out how carriers and manufacturers worked together in the early days of aviation to build aircraft that were specific to what the airlines needed. We've almost gotten back to that point again. Boeing and Airbus have both adapted their product lines to meet the demands of the airlines, mainly in a narrow-body, long-range, efficient aircraft in the 737 and A320 lines, a highly efficient composite aircraft in the 787 and A350 lines, and then a long-range, efficient carrier both in the A380, 777, and 747-8. Regional aircraft manufacturers have adapted their product lines as well both Bombardier and Embraer offering larger aircraft that can fly longer ranges and carry up to 100 passengers. In summary, fleet planning is a complicated process but is imperative to the success of both airline and cargo commercial operators. Thorough analysis of the business model of the carrier, goals, objectives, plans for expansion all have to be taken into consideration in fleet planning. Proper research and analysis of available aircraft provides carriers the opportunity to develop a fleet that will not only meet their current needs, but future needs and maximize revenue. On a personal note to the carriers, don't be afraid to embrace a configuration that doesn't include middle seats. Nobody likes them, 